my friend. Sounds good. And I love that idea of gathering. Ladon, I know you. <laughs> Ladon is my aunt. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to be on this. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and we just saw each other probably for the first time in I don't know how many years, only a few weeks ago. So that was really cool. Anyway, I'm so glad to be here. Um, well, I'm grateful to, to share some things with you, um, just to give you a little background about why I'm here and, and what I'm here to share. And, and I, I'm hoping to hear a little bit about who all of you are and, and kind of what you're seeing and what you're doing. But um, I'm, I'm Cade Johnson. I'm My role within seminaries and institutes is um, I'm called the Adapted Needs Manager. So I work in the church office building and support anything that we're doing for our students with disabilities or any other challenge like life life challenges, emotional, mental wellness struggles. And, um, and so I'm new though, um, you all have taught seminary more than I ever have. I've never taught a seminary class. So I've worked for the church for only about a year. And my, my previous experience though is, is working in public schools. I was a special education teacher as well as a school psychologist for several years and taught at some um, colleges and universities in some of those same areas. And so bringing some of that perspective into what we're doing within seminaries and institutes and just how to support support our teachers and, and everything that we're doing. So I'm so grateful to be here and I'm excited to, to learn right along with you and to maybe just share a few thoughts on um, some of the, the things that we're doing and supporting our kids so and our students. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing. Um, is always the hardest part for me. All right. So do you see the full screen? Do you see the right screen? Okay, you don't see all my notes or anything? Okay, sounds good. So I wanna start with, um, what have you seen? And I would love feedback. What are you seeing? What learning challenges have you observed? Or maybe you haven't observed, but you kind of know there's something going on with your students. Um, and it can be anything from, you know, uh, an honest to goodness learning challenge, maybe struggling with reading, or even just shyness, anxiety, maybe some depression, just different types of things that you're seeing. What what have you seen? We have a, um, de a developmentally challenged person in our class. Okay. He's a little autistic on the autistic side, but very bright, very sweet, very willing to participate. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. And it, is it Tanya? Is that how you pronounce your name? Go ahead. Tanya. Tanya. Okay, Tanya. Thank you. So mine isn't really a disability, but I have um, three or four students. I'm trying to think. Yeah, it's three um, that are that English is a second language for them. And so one of them, I actually volunteered to get on Zoom with him a little bit early to um, practice English because he was so worried about coming to the gathering and think he couldn't speak. And one of the women had um, the same experience. He's from Georgia, like Georgia on the Black Sea. <laughs> oh. And um, and the two of the other women are from Brazil. And it turns out actually that they lived in the same stake and they're both living in Florida, not far from each other right now. And they didn't know that until they got on Zoom that night. And so now they, are feeling more encouraged if one of them starts to stumble and trying to find a word. But um, uh, it, I don't know, I guess it's just been welcoming them and helping them realize that, you know, even those of us who speak English don't say the right words. <laughs> hey, yeah, I don't know any other languages and I've never really other taken one Spanish class in high school. I've never tried to learn, but can you imagine trying to learn anything but trying to learn the gospel in a different language, how intimidating that might be? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Brother Goldhart, did you have a, a thought? Yeah, I have a student who uh, really struggles, probably has like a fifth grade level reading or uh, reading level. And so going through the scriptures and trying to pull principles and doctrines is really a struggle for him um, and helping him understand that there's other other tools out there to be able to do so has been really enlightening for him because I don't think he has ever listened to the scriptures. He's just struggled through them. Right. Yeah. Thank you. And that's very common. Um, Sister Porter, or Potter, I'm sorry, Sister Potter. Yes. Um, I have a student who's autistic and he has, um, from what his mom said, he's about second grade level. And so 
he loves the videos and the seminary lessons, but he, um, the lessons are too much. They, he struggles through those. So mm -hmm. just trying to work and help him be able to, to participate, but he's, um, yeah, he's wonderful. He's so sweet. Yeah. And what an awesome opportunity for him to join and be a part of whatever he can. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah. So, so many different examples, um, you know, and I think that the, one of the most important things, I, I think sometimes we get stuck on like a label or a title or a diagnose, you know, and I don't think that that's how the Lord sees us, right? He doesn't see us as a person with a, a label. He sees us as his children and he loves us. And um, when you're talking about languages a minute ago, I want to share an example here just in a minute. Um, Tanya, if you want to share your thought quick, and I'm going to, I'm going to move on to uh, an example here. And um, well, I was thinking Institute because that's where I'm at right now. But last year when I was teaching seminary, but in person, I had a girl that um, had Down syndrome. I actually had her for a couple of years, one year in Zoom because we were in, in Canvas because we were in um, COVID. And then last year in person, and um, one of the things I did was I made her president of the class for a month. We used to switch every month. Somebody else was the president. And she just loved getting to call on who was going to say the prayer and who was going to um, um, pick the song and different things. And, and she, like when she would bear her testimony, like everyone, like just you know, would feel it like she was so close to the Lord. It was just phenomenal. Um, yeah. So it wasn't like she, you know, like sometimes she might have a hard time, like, like sometimes I had a hard time understanding what she was saying, but as the spirit helped me, I finally learned her language. <laughs> yeah, I love it. She's being taught the language in her own language, the gospel in her own language and through the spirit. Um, that it reminded me of a class I observed, um, a, a seminary class, and um, they, they, it was an adapted needs class. So kind of like a class where they have kids, it was in, in Utah, where they have kids who have different disabilities, and then they have like a peer mentor to, to sit with them and support them. And um, this young lady, her, her friend wasn't there that day to support her. So I was there just kind of joining the class. And so the teacher asked me, would, would you sit next to, to this young lady? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And so I sat next to her. And we just, you know, we were going through some things and I was helping her look, look at some things. And, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she just started crying, like loud, really loud crying. And I was like, oh no, what did I do? <laughs> you know, I was like, what happened? And the teacher just looked at me and she's like, it's okay. That means she's feeling the spirit. And I was like, oh, okay. And so she, she did that. And then at the end of her crying session, she just, she's like, I just want to tell she in like very eloquent language too, you know, for this young lady, she said, I love Jesus. And she testified. And that's exactly what it was. She was crying. But for me, I, it, it took me a minute. I, I could have been thinking all kinds of things, but that teacher had took the time to know her student and she took the time to listen and understand and discern what her needs are and, and knew. And so it was a perfect example. Uh, one, one other example of this that I just heard today, and this, this is such a touching example. We have, um, and, it, and it, this is for you, if you hear of any students who who are deaf, if you know of any students who, who want to participate in seminary or institute that are deaf, we have a wonderful deaf um, seminary and institute program. It's, and it's done online remote, remote gathering through Zoom so they can communicate through ASL. And um, I was talking to our coordinator over that program and he was telling me about a young man who he just met. He joined one of the classes and was just talking to this young man through ASL, through Zoom at the end of the class. And he shared with him, he said, I just joined this seminary class this year. Last year, I was in the, the other class, just in, at my, my regular seminary. I tried to follow along. They had an interpreter for me for a little bit, but not all the time. Um, I was going to my, my parents' family ward, which was a Spanish-speaking ward. His dad was the bishop there. And he just didn't really catch what was going on. He, didn't, he couldn't really participate in a lot of the youth activities. But this year, three things happened. He started ASL seminary. He was being taught the gospel in his own language. He started attending an ASL branch without his parents that was in the area. And he started hearing the gospel in his own language. And then this summer he attended a deaf FSY session that was all done in, in ASL. And this young man, how excited he was. He was just like, I had no idea. I'd see a picture of Jesus, but I had no idea. And how wonderful would it have been if somebody would have taken the chance at some point to be thinking, you know, what, 
what kinds of um, observing what I need to do to help this young man a little bit better. And this is what, what I want to share. This is from Elder Bednar. Um, he says, teaching is not talking and telling. Rather, teaching is observing, listening, and discerning. So we then know what to say. And I, I think of this and that that's powerful. What are we doing? You know, and I, I want to focus on some of these things as we go through this. There's all kinds of strategies and things we could try, but if we can do better at observing and listening and discerning, then we'll know what to say. We'll know how to teach. We'll know how to say it in whatever language it might be. It might even just be the language of our hearts. But um, I think identifying the need of a learner is probably one of the most important things for us to do before we try anything else, any other fancy intervention that we might try to help teach a student. So in that in that mindset, what I want to do first is just give it, give us all a little bit of a perspective on what statistically is a part of our class. And these are national kind of statistics of uh, different types of disabilities and, and other mental health challenges. They'll show on a graph here. But I, I would be willing to bet, Brother Goldhart and I kind of messaged each other back and forth about this. I, I think that we probably have more students in our online programs with these types of challenges than we would in some of the other institute and seminary classes because it's maybe feel a little bit more of a safe place for them. And so I think, you know, I don't know the exact numbers, but we might have even more than what these show. So let me let me share this. Um, this is um, this is high school age. So any of you familiar with an IEP or special education services um, for students? So um, this this is about 14 percent of kids in a school have what's called an IEP. That means they've been identified. They have a diagnosed some sort of a disability. Could be a learning disability. Could be autism. Could be a lot of different things. I'll show that in a second. Some have what's called this a 504 plan. It's an accommodation plan to help give somebody equal access. And then estimated 13 to 20 percent of, of young adults have some or your youth have some sort of a mental illness, like a diagnosed. That's not counting all those who, who haven't had a, received a diagnosis. And again, we're not worried about the labels. We're just thinking like, OK, in our class, at least a third, at least a third of your students have something that's been diagnosed or some sort of challenge that they're facing every day. Um, this is a graph of this 14% right here. So those who have an IEP, about a third of them have what's called a learning disability. A learning disability, that's probably really common in your classes. Very intelligent, smart. Uh, you maybe wouldn't know they have a learning challenge. They could potentially be the captain of the football team or, or something like that. But they, they struggle with some sort of learning, uh, whether it be reading or math or writing. Um, autism is, is a very common struggle. And again, that's such a huge range. You know, people say, you, you know, if you've met somebody with autism, you've met somebody with autism. <laughs> you've met one person without, they're all different. <laughs> every, you know, very, very different presentations and different struggles and strengths and all those things. Um, ADHD, this is a common category in the schools of, uh, where it's called other health impairment and ADHD falls under that mostly. And we've got the emotional disabilities, other vision, hearing, communication, orthopedic, kind of like physical mobility. So these are all the different kinds of things you might see. And this one, I want to kind of highlight this. A lot of times when we think disabilities, we think of those that are very obvious. The ones that, you know, somebody mentioned a, a young person with Down syndrome. So it's pretty obvious. We know that they have um, some, they have a genetic um, disability from birth and they have some cognitive delays. And it's pretty obvious. We know that there's something going on there. But look at, that's only 6%. The rest of these, you may not know from the first glance. Um, you know, autism, in some cases you might know. In some cases, it might take you a little while to determine that's what's going on. So this is just to give us an idea. There are a lot of, a lot of struggles. And so from there, what do we do? You know, um, I want to, who's familiar with the concept of universal design? Anybody want to share or anything you've heard about universal design? And if you haven't, that's okay. Okay, I just grabbed a drink of water. <laughs> so the idea of universal design, specifically for learning, uh, in the community, they, they kind of use this, the curb cut effect. Uh, and no, I don't know if anybody here may use a wheelchair or not, but if you don't use a wheelchair, have any of you ever benefited from having a curb cut out on a sidewalk while you were pushing a stroller or, you know, you're holding a lot of things and you don't have to step over it, right? So it's 
kind of same idea here, um, like the push button to enter a building, you know, where there's like the little circle, the handicap button, you can kind of bump it with your elbow a little bit if you've got your hands full and then you can get out. Um, so this is an, ex those are examples of something that were designed from the beginning to help support some, somebody who may have a disability, but in the end, it helps everybody really. Um, automatic toilet flusher. Nobody wants to touch the <laughs> toilet flusher in a public bathroom, right? But that helps us out. So those are examples. So um, we're going to talk about a few different types of things in, in our learning and in our teaching that we can do that are similar. Th this graph here, just, just to show how this works, when we look at interventions for kids that are struggling with learning, whether it be kind of some kind of a disability, a lot of times they sh this triangle is used. And what this is saying is that we can usually meet the needs of about 80% of students using some sort of universal design type intervention, something that just makes things accessible for everybody else. Another example would be like using captions. You may notice on right now, everything that all of us are saying is being captioned at the bottom of this. That may help somebody who could be hard of hearing. Um, and so just another example of a universal design principle that could help a lot of people, even if you're not deaf, right? Um, and if you watch movies with the captions on, even though you can hear it, <laughs> right? So, um, just remember that, you know, you can reach most students with those kinds of things. There may be specific things you need to do, like group interventions for the kind of this 15, top 15 percent, or even that top 5 percent may need more specific things. But generally, there's some things we can do. All right. Any thoughts? And before I move on to some examples, anybody have any examples? Share something that you've done in your class that that um, was something that you tried that maybe made something accessible for one student, but then ultimately helped a lot of students. Anybody have any examples? Or just in life? I have a student that is, English is her second language and I asked her to say a prayer and she's like, I can't do that except in Spanish. And I'm like, well then say it in Spanish, you know? And it gave her an opportunity to participate that she didn't have otherwise. Right, yeah, love it. That's, that's a good example, I like that. Any other thoughts? I do. Yeah, um, I've, I've been a public school teacher for 20, 20 some years. I don't teach any longer, but um, the thing that I find myself bleeding over into teaching seminary and institute is sort of the differentiated learning teaching where uh, you just explain something in several different ways um, that benefits even somebody that doesn't have any of those slices of the pie. They're just having a hard time understanding something. And when you, you when you explain it maybe in three or four different ways from different angles, um, it helps everyone to uh, come to the same understanding. Yeah, perfect. That's a perfect example. Um, in fact, I think that's the first one on here. So here's just some some ideas, um, and these are some of these may not apply for online. I kind of had this couple of these slides with some other presentations, but first variety of ways, you know, how could you know? How many of us benefit when there's something visual connected to what we're learning, right? You know, somebody can talk to us all day long, but if we can see something that goes with it or someone models it for us and shows us how to do it first, or we get to practice it with a partner first, or, um, you know, those kinds of things, um, pairing with a variety of ways, exactly like you said. Um, online, especially, you know, I, I know that a lot of the, the content, and Brother Goldhart, you can probably help clarify. I'm not sure exactly how the content is, but a lot of it's already established there. But I know some of those things have a lot of, um, you know, visual representations. You know, how, how often are we using those in the in the online classes? Yeah, we, we're, especially in the seminary, we're moving a lot towards using icons to represent certain things and to be able to, so that when a, a student gets to a certain icon, they know, oh, this means I'm going to be submitting a, uh, an assignment, or this means I'm going to watch a video. And, and so you're seeing a lot more of that in terms of our design. I also like that we're trying to use as many videos to help with context as possible so that it's not just before you get into the scriptures, it's let's take a few minutes to watch this video clip that will help bring relevance or context to what we're going to be studying. Yeah. I mean, so, so much more. I mean, right now, you know, studying Isaiah with our, our kids, you know, I mean, all of us have experienced this, right? You know, we're, we're trying to make some meaning out of these words, but, you know, if we can break it down into like a visual piece and like 
even like, you know, we're, we're, we've been studying the Book of Mormon actually along with Isaiah and, and we're reading like maybe five verses and then breaking it and, and explaining it in different ways, showing it in different ways, practicing it in different ways. And, and it just brings things to life so much more. Um, you know, as we're doing our, you know, your weekly gatherings, right? You guys have a weekly gathering where you kind of meet over Zoom and, you know, are, are there ways that, that we can present and share things in, in a, you know, more um, visual way or a different type of way? Um, talked about closed captions, but participation. You know, what, what are some ways that we can kind of get a lot of people to participate? These, these might apply a little bit more like in a classroom, but there, there's other ways we can can try to engage people online too. Um, you know, are, are we using, you know, like uh, breaking kid, people out into groups? Like even in this large group right here, right now we've got, I don't know how many people are on the, the screen, but sometimes we're a little reluctant to pipe up and say something. But then when we get put with just two people in a little partnership, you know, someone might participate a little bit more willingly. Um, do we allow for other modes of participation? If there's somebody who's, who's, who's got maybe some debilitating anxiety, they don't want to go to the university and attend a, an institute class in person. That, that would just be very difficult for them. And now they're in this online class. Are there ways that we can have them participate without causing them to feel overly anxious? You know, is there, are there, you know, can they do it just a chat with the teacher back and forth so the whole, whole class doesn't have to, you know, hear what's going on? So just, just some different thoughts. Um, microphone wouldn't really apply for online, but um, extra time. How, anybody ever uh, noticed um, a, a student who takes a little bit longer to process something? That was me, <laughs> all through school. I was always, even in graduate school, <laughs> I was always the last one to finish the test. Uh, and it frustrated me so much when I, the you know, teacher would ask a question and before I had a chance to even think about the question and process it in my mind, somebody else was answering the question. And then I was like, well, whatever, I'm not even going <laughs> to think about this. You know, so any, something we could try would be, all right, we're, in a minute, I'm going to ask a question. So I want you to be thinking of this question and see if you can think of maybe three responses for this question in your mind. I'm going to give you about 15 seconds to be thinking about this. So the question is, this. So think for 15 seconds, and then I'm going to ask three of you to share, you know, so that would give a student that processing time and uh, would get them thinking. And especially those students that are typically not going to join in or participate, it'll make, give them that opportunity to do that. That the normal um, processing time is about five to 10 seconds is that um, typical wait time for a student to, to process, which when you're when you're you're presenting, sometimes that seems like a really long time to pause for ten seconds. <laughs> so maybe something something to try. Any any thoughts on those? Any other ideas? You know, just general ways to present or to participate. You know, help facilitate particip participation for students who may be struggling. Cade, with the pause that you were talking about, I noticed that when we went to teaching online for Zoom. Like first I taught gospel doctrine over Zoom. And I realized that when you ask a question, you have to have that, you have to be comfortable with that silence while people think about it and process. So um, in my institute class, I like to say, I'm gonna tell you a story and then I'm gonna ask you this question after I tell you my example of this. And I'm gonna ask for your examples after I tell you mine. So that gives them the time that I'm telling the story to be able to think about their own examples and to, and I found that that way I get a lot more people to participate and to answer and tell their experiences because they've had that five minutes or three minutes to think about it. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I love that. I've, <clears throat> I've noticed that the, the lessons I've participated in as a learner, that quiet time is actually time for revelation. You know, um, times we feel like we need to be filling that time and, and that's not the best learning for, for most of us. I mean, if we think to our, even our own in, individual learning, if it's not part of a class, 
usually I, I, I receive those bits of inspiration and revelation when I'm quiet and I'm taking the time to ponder peacefully and um, what a what a wonderful way to allow that you know and especially if we've got um, you know students with who may have more um, more challenging developmental struggles you know um, somebody who has um, you know some cognitive delays asking them a very specific question and then saying I want you to think about this and then I, I'd like after you've thought about it write something down or draw a picture that represents what you're thinking and then in about five minutes we're, we're going to have you share that with the class so be thinking about you know what I mean you can it's kind of like that setup and then giving the time and the processing so um <clears throat> awesome any other ideas or thoughts that came to your mind on these ones when you said draw a picture it reminded me of when I was teaching seminary and I had a a kiddo in my class. I actually only had two kids, a brother and a sister in, in my class, but the, the kiddo was in my class and he was, he had ADHD really bad. And so I would say, let's read the scripture story, talk about it. And then you draw me a picture of what you heard. And when we were talking about um, the people going to uh, one of the kings in the Book of Mormon, and it said that the scripture said they went without arms to, mm -hmm. before the king. And he drew a picture of this whole pile of people with no arms on, and this whole pile of arms on the ground. And every time I get to that scripture, 10, 15 years later, I think about that picture that he drew of them going to the king without arms. But that's mm -hmm. what he heard. And that's how he remembered that scripture. He knew what it was talking about. But yeah. that's how he chose to represent that scripture. And it stuck with me for all these years. Yeah, I love that. That's so funny. <laughs> that, that reminds me, too, just another thought, you know, um, I've had a lot of experiences working with young people with autism and, you know, they, they may read that, you know, it sounds like this student was, was just kind of being a little silly and, and did understand, but some students, you know, some of our young people with autism or adults who have autism, they, they may read that without arms. They're very literal in their thinking and that, um, you know, understanding what the scriptures mean might be difficult in some cases, if, it, if there's, you know, a difficulty in understanding what what's literally being said or what's, maybe a parable, you know, or something like that. So, um, Stephanie, did you have a thought? Um, yes, um, I've been doing my lesson on a PowerPoint so that I can put it up on the screen. That way they can see the quote that I'm reading or they can see the questions I'm going to be asking. And I tell them just to, you know, look at these questions. And while I'm reading this, you can pick, you know, one of the questions that you want to answer or else I'll you know, do things that way. That way I don't have to, you know, repeat myself. I don't have to embarrass anyone. And they have time to to think about what they want to say and, and how they feel about that. And, you know, how, when they did the preparation before, you know, what they were thinking and feeling about it then too. Yeah, that's it's setting the stage, you know, setting the stage for learning, which is for, for some learners, they may not need that. But for a lot of learners, they will. And especially those who may not be obvious to us that there could be some learning challenges going on. If we were to do that, that's going to help so many students. A perfect example of a universal design instruction type uh, principle to affect everybody. You know, you're going to help a lot of different learners that way. I love that. Um, let me just share. These are some some other other thoughts. Uh, these are these are kind of like cautions, I guess. I don't know about cautions, but just things to kind of be aware of. Sometimes we may stick our foot in our mouth, right? <laughs> we we have the best intentions. We're, we're trying to do our best. But to, to look at on the, the left side, um, reading can be a very, very intimidating thing for people. You know, for, for example, I, I was serving with the, the deacons for, for several years and I was one of the leaders and um, the other, it was actually another brother Johnson. <laughs> and actually we had a brother Scott too. So it was Johnson and Johnson and Scott. So we told the boys that we were the toilet paper team. So it was pretty cool. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, the other brother, Johnson, he, you know, he, we became good friends, but he, he struggled to read as an adult. He, he told me that he's like, I barely passed high school. My teachers just kind of let me through. 
And then right after high school, I had a family member that owned a plumbing business and I just jumped right in. But here he is now, he actually owns that plumbing business as an adult, but he still can't read very well. So very successful person, but reading even in front of these 12 year old deacons was intimidating for him. And um, so so he, he would do it and he'd try to work through it. But I mean, he, he kind of had a conversation with me sometimes. He's like, hey, if we're teaching, if you could do the reading, that would be helpful because uh, I don't want to have to read in front of the boys. I'm like, okay, you know, that, and so we were able to do that. So have we have we thought about that? You know, and I don't know how often in, in online classes are we asking students to read out loud. But it, but if you do, you know, in your, your gatherings, be let's be, be conscious of that. And then, and then it's, and especially if they're trying to do things on their own, how are we accommodating or modifying for a reading struggle if, if a student may have some struggles with that? So um, do you guys do reading out loud in groups? Is that something that's common in your remote gatherings or no? Yes, we do. Okay. So one thought, anybody heard the term popcorn reading before? You know, they can call it different things. If we're going to bounce around, you read, then you read, then you read. So just keep this thought in your mind. Picture yourself in a, in a setting. So my friend, Brother Johnson, um, who, who may be in, in a Sunday school class, and it's time to do popcorn reading, or he knows that they're going to go down the row, and eventually it's going to be his turn to read. If he doesn't want to look like he doesn't know how to read, what might he do to get out of reading? Any thoughts? <laughs> I think it's quite possible that somebody if if they don't feel comfortable reading and they're or they feel embarrassed and if uh there's a chance that they'll be called then they just may not come yeah they may not come they're, they're just not going to be there or maybe or they're going to be the ones that are hey i need to go to the bathroom or they're going to be the class clown or they're going to disrupt you know it, and, and it may look to us that this is a disruptive student. They don't care and they don't want to be here. But really, we've set them up to be put in an embarrassing situation, potentially. And so now they're left with no choice, but I'm going to look cool still. And so I'm going to act up or, or whatever. You know what I mean? So just just to, just something to be thinking about as, as we're, we're asking students to read. And, um, you know, we may ask for volunteers or we may, may, may ask them to read individually to us. You know, if we have a chance, hey, let's read these passages after class together for a minute and get an idea of where they're really at, you know. So um, another another one is um, social awareness, um, you know, the ability to kind of have that back and forth interaction and communication. And we see that struggle, not just some with somebody who may have an actual diagnosis, maybe anxiety or even autism, but some people just are a little bit more introverted and that's totally fine. The world would not work if we didn't have introverted people. You know, we, we need all types, but um, something to be kind of aware of is if, if there's someone there, not that we don't want to push people. I heard in a meeting the other day that we <clears throat> we have our, our comfortable zone, our growing zone, and then the danger zone. It's okay to push to the grow a little bit zone, but let's kind of know our students well enough that we don't push them into the danger zone where they're like, that, that's it, I'm not coming to that class anymore because the teacher kind of makes me feel uncomfortable because I'm so shy or whatever, you know. So, so another thing to just kind of keep in mind of, you know, where people are at with those, those kinds of things. Um, sometimes we may use sarcasm in our, you know, teachers often do this, you know, different kinds of just idioms or sarcasm. It's raining cats and dogs. And some students may not understand that, you know, the literal kind of thinking, uh, especially with our students with, with autism um, or sensory sensitivities. You know, we may not have as much control with those kinds of things, but Let's say, for example, we have a, a present PowerPoint presentation. If there's so many stimuli on there and so many cute little pictures and all these little things, it may be so distracting for some students that they miss the point of what you're really trying to share. <clears throat> Not all students, some of them might like that, but that, that may, may be a distraction. <clears throat> um, you may not see the, the mobility issues in an online class, but um, vision and hearing. Does anybody have any, any students who have um, who are either blind or deaf or hard of hearing? Anybody worked with any of the students? If you do, um, just know that there are there are a lot of accessible materials 
or, or um, on the church website even, um, there's a, um, for, for people who are visually impaired, the church website follows the, the national, I think it's WCAG is what it's called, but the standards for, for online material. So, you know, images should all have some sort of description on them. So there, there's a lot of a lot of different resources for people who have those kinds of uh, disabilities. But, and actually, I'll show you those, that website here in a minute when I'm done. Um, just some other I ideas or thoughts. Uh, when we're talking about individuals, it's important to use people first language. Uh, and what that means is, you know, when we're, we may, you know, if we're, even if you're talking with your, a family member, you know, and you're, you're talking about a student in your class, we would refer to that person who, for example, is blind, we would say a person in my class who's blind rather than the blind kid in my class. You know, it's, it's we, we wanna think of who this person is first, they're a person, they're a child of God, and then, you know, maybe a struggle that they have. So just thinking of that, those terms of person first language. And, and this one can be very common in teaching sometimes. And uh, just because we, we want to we wanna have a good sense of humor and be funny, but let's be careful with our words that we use, you know, you know, these examples. I mean, I'm so OCD, you know, I'm so bipolar, you know, what if your student is bipolar and they just started taking medication uh, for that? And it's, it's a sensitive topic for them. You know, oh, my friend lost so much weight. They look great. They're an anorexic, you know, like joking about these things in our mind. But we don't know how that will affect somebody else. Um, so, you know, you kind of get the idea. Take a chill pill. You know, so these, these, these kind of ideas, just to be sensitive to, again, what we may not know that, that could be out there. Uh, also, um, specifically stories about mental health or, you know, we may be sharing a, a, a story that's very dear to our own hearts, maybe maybe a challenge that you may have personally even overcome, you know, of, of maybe when you were experiencing some depression and, you know, and, and you're sharing this with a heartfelt intent. Um, and I'm not saying you can't share those stories, but I'm just saying, let's just be thinking about that. You know, if, if I'm, if I'm a student and I'm just dealing with debilitating depression and just struggling, and I just hear my institute teacher talk about how they overcame they, their depression because they read and they read their, their scriptures and they prayed and finally they overcame it. And that's wonderful. But what if they're thinking, I've done all that stuff. I've prayed my heart out. I've studied the scriptures so much. I've been trying and I don't know how, to, you know what I mean? So just again, being sensitive to could any story I share trigger something for someone who may be struggling with that challenge. And that, and that especially goes for other types of things like death and suicide or other just serious challenges that, that we all face um, in our attempt to share a comforting story or experience. Um, let's ask, just ask ourselves, could we possibly be making that more difficult for somebody else? So um, any, any thoughts on any of these, any examples of, of, you know, maybe situations where you've been in a situation like this and either <laughs> maybe we did put our foot in our mouth and we thought differently later or or where it went well, or, or maybe somebody shared some feedback with you. What are, what are some examples or, or situations you've been in before? And we'll give it that 10 second wait time. <laughs> Brother Goldhart, you had a thought? Yeah, I, I made an interesting mistake once where I was, when I was trying to help a, a young man, it was when my, early in my career, he, he just didn't want to read. And I just kept putting him on the spot thinking, okay, well, if I just give you opportunities, you're going to be fine. Um, I, but I never asked the question as to why he didn't want to read or what's wrong. Or do you have struggles? And it really, it was really heartbreaking because I went at parent teacher conference the the mom's like he doesn't know how to read <laughs> he's he's learning and so every time you put him on the spot it has increased his desires not to go to church not to go to seminary and it was really heartbreaking for me to recognize that I was causing more pain for the kid trying to help him than I was trying to find ways to 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 be helpful so it was for this young man, it was really good because that was right when iPods were starting to come out. I know I'm 
speaking of ancient history here uh, but mom bought an ipod and we put the scriptures on that and and that's how he was able to read and i just learned not to ask him to read in front of the class but rather tell me about his experience when he was listening to the scriptures last night type of a thing and so he could still participate could still share but i was very careful with the questions i asked and not putting him on the spot to read in front of the class if, if that makes sense yeah perfect example and, and it may take time sometimes to get to know the needs of our students um in a minute I, we're, i'm going to talk about just some just questions we can ask ourselves to to maybe understand what the needs are because that's really the skill we want to develop as a teacher is how do i determine the need you know back to you know elder bednar uh, observing and listening and discerning uh, so that we can understand and know how to teach our students um but uh yeah it's 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 so so important to know and i take that time to get to know them um all right let me share so th this is the skill but most importantly the holy ghost will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance you know from from the new testament we know that but the holy ghost is the the master teacher and that's who's teaching your classes hopefully that's who's who's providing the teaching but that's also who will teach you as a teacher to know and discern and understand what the needs of the students are so here's just a, just a few thoughts um, and questions that we can kind of self-reflect on uh, so what have you noticed that might be impacting a student's ability to fully participate in the learning experience so you know brother goldhart you you noticed at first that your student didn't want to read right so he's like he doesn't want to read so then we can kind of ask ourselves, well, wonder why, you know, is it, why does he not want to read it, you know, so we can kind of ask ourselves some more questions. Um, and it's important when we're doing that to frame our observations into observable, measurable statements. And, and what that means is, so, so many times I've heard teachers say, and this is in public schools or seminary or wherever it may be, the kid is just driving me nuts and they don't even want to be here. Okay, how do you know? <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> they don't want to be here and what does that mean they're driving you nuts like I didn't know this had anything to do with you right and so well, let, let's let's dig down a little bit and what is it that we're really seeing okay he when I ask him to read he shuts down his eyes look to the floor and he shakes his head and says no okay that's that's what I'm seeing that might trigger your mind to think a little bit more like well, I wonder why and um for other, you know, what's behind the learning challenge? Like what might be driving that? We could ask ourselves those kinds of questions. For, for these kind, of, you know, sometimes it could be a variety of reasons. Sometimes there's attention seeking type behaviors from like their peer or their teacher. Sometimes they're trying to avoid or get out of something, you know, for in the case of this reading example you shared, um, you know, maybe the students are trying to get out of reading. And so, you found a better way to help him still access the scriptures and participate, but still get, he still got out of reading technically. So he was able to get what he needed, but he still got what you needed him to learn as the teacher to be able to participate in the scriptures in a different way. You know, they could be seeking sensory input, or are they just trying to get access to something? Could a behavior trigger that or some sort of other learning challenge? Just a few other questions. Um, you heard them read, we kind of talked about that. How do they get along with their peers or their social struggles? Um, if we're asking to them to do a joint learning activity and they don't know how to do that, and that's why they're in an online class maybe, because they struggle in person, maybe that would be good to know. Um, there are their focus, struggle issues. You know, sometimes there's neurological, like ADHD, or uh, things going on in your brain that's just very difficult to focus or sit long or even stay organized and to follow through and to initiate tasks and participate in that way. That may be a struggle. Um, organization shy, depressed. And this, I think this question is do we know them well enough to discern why they might seem shy or anxious or depressed? Are they depressed or are they just tired because they had a bunch of exams in their college classes the day before and they, you know, stayed up all night studying, but they really still wanted to get to the institute and they just seemed depressed that day, but really they're just tired. Well, that would only take a few questions. Hey, how are your classes going? Um, you know, are you getting enough sleep? You look a little tired, you know, or what? I don't know. You just, just you just get to know them a little bit and you, you find out what's going on in their lives so that we can listen and observe and then discern the need. And you know, are there some verbal, verbal struggles? 
So um, this, I just share these thoughts. These, these aren't necessarily like the be all end all questions, but these are just a few examples. Um, so hopefully as, as we've been talking today, um, the goal, I guess my goal, again, because we can't go into every specific thing. I'm going to share a couple of resources with you online in a second. But if we can do better at understanding and identifying needs of our students by, as Elder Bednar said, observing, listening, and then discerning, then we can take some action. Then we can make a change or a little bit of a shift or a tweak in how we deliver the instruction or how we uh, have them participate how we um, engage with them or whatever it might be, um, we can um, do that. So I wanna take just, let's see what time is it. We go until six or like for another nine minutes, right? Okay, so let's take just three minutes. Uh, I'll just set the timer, I'll just take three minutes. Will you just do this and pull out a piece of paper or, or wherever you wanna put it on your computer. Um, think of one student who you know in your class right now, or maybe a student you've had in the past, who is experiencing some sort of learning challenge, could be anything. And then go through some of these questions and, and write down some answers that come to you. So see if you can come up with maybe what is what are some of their needs that maybe you haven't thought of by maybe going through these questions. Does that, does that sound okay? Just take a couple, about three minutes and, and go through that and then we'll maybe have somebody share. Give you about one more minute, just one of your students and uh, trying to discern what their needs are by answering some of these questions. All right. Is, will somebody, is anybody willing to just share just the process that you went through and, and how that went and what you learned? And, and if it's okay, actually, so we can see each other, I'm going to just stop sharing the screen. Who, who'd be willing to share just what, what you came up with? I would. So I didn't have any paper, so, but I did sit and, you know, I took a picture and really looked at it. And I realized that Heavenly Father wants us to know that they're children of him and that they're a child of God and that um, all of us have struggles in our lives. And if we give them to the Lord, that he'll make them our strengths, like he did with Moses. He gave him Aaron to help him out, you know, and to let those kids know that they're not alone in their struggles and that even prophets sometimes struggle. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So powerful that Heavenly Father does know. And, and I think that's the, the wonder of the, the Godhead. Our Father knows them. Jesus Christ experienced some of the struggles they're experiencing. And the Holy Ghost will teach you and teach us what those are and help us as teachers. Thank you. 
Did anybody else have any thoughts that they wanted to share? Okay. If I'm going to share quickly just a couple. Of, oh, did you, um, Brother Cunningham, did you want to share? Just real briefly, I just had a student last year. I um, found out that over time that she had a uh, high schooler, but she was learning out of a sixth grade book at home. So she didn't have quite the level of education as everybody else. But I just simply found that um, giving her the permission to say, I don't know, but here's what I think, or I don't know, but here's what I'm feeling, uh, was able to open her up into uh, sharing what she thought or what she didn't, she felt comfortable in answering, even if she knew it may or may not be the right answer, um, that any answer was okay. And as long as she was able to say, you know, I'm not sure, or I don't know, but um, really exploded for her. So Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Stephanie, please. Um, my daughter was in an online institute class. She wasn't my student. But I remember the, the teachers who wanted her to, you know, show her face instead of being able to, you know, turn off her video feed. It made her really anxious and she was not able to participate at all. And so not, you know, making someone feel like they are making someone feel like they don't have to have their video on can actually help pe some people who have a lot of anxiety. Yeah. How powerful can the, our approach in doing that be for either good or bad? You know, or we we can either say hey, you have to have your video on, or we could you know take take a moment to talk to that student after class. Be like, hey, I just want to get to know you a little bit. You know, tell me tell me how you're feeling. How does it feel in the class for you when we're all there on on camera? How, is it comfortable for you? You know, and, and just asking some of those kinds of questions. And we're so glad you're here. We're so grateful that you're participating with us. And then, and just understanding the needs of that student, they, they might may share those those thoughts if it's presented in that way, as opposed to, "Hey, your camera needs to be on," right? So, yeah, what a wonderful insight. Um, okay, I think that Stephanie, you just shared, right? I think your hand's still up, but you just that was you that just shared, right? Okay. Um, quickly, I'm going to show just so you. Some of you may or may not have seen this. Um, I'm going to try to share again. Sorry, I've got like 100 windows open and I shouldn't. Okay. So, okay. So this is the on the church website. It's under the life help section. Um, and under here, there, there are a lot of different resources and types of things, um, all kinds of topics. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you. But one of them is here disabilities so if you click on that one you all can see my screen okay right okay so here here there's there's several different um just resources that the church has put out this one is actually really good Th this is designed more for younger children the way the videos are presented but there's a series i think there's eight videos here on just strategies for teaching students with disabilities and they're like a minute or less each video using visual aids so there, there's some some kind of help videos there but but also um, I mentioned accessible formats so you know some the ASL materials things that are in audio format closed caption but anyway there's just a, a lot of different braille, web braille so if you come across uh, any students who need those kinds of things but other other resources um, there's just some good good um, types of videos and things that you might find helpful here uh, another area on the life help section um, that, I mean, honestly, you may come across students who, who may be experiencing a lot of these, these life challenges in their life, but um, there's one on mental and emotional health, and there's a lot of great resources here that you might find helpful as you're, as you're teaching your students and getting to know them, especially if you find, um, you know, any students that are struggling with some of those challenges. Um, and so, Anyway, just kind of wanted to point that that out um, of all these different types of resources. But and on top of that, if if you come across any specific questions or any specific concerns for our students, that maybe like that pyramid graph I showed you with the eighty percent, you come across, you're like, hey, I've got this kid that kind of falls in this five percent on the top, and I'm not sure what to do. You know, and these kind of general principles that we talked about may not totally meet their needs, please reach out to and Brother Goldheart 
he, he can reach out to me or, or anybody else. And we're, we're happy to provide very like more specific support and ideas and interventions and things you could try to help meet the needs of your students. And we're just, I'm grateful to be here with you. And I, I'm, I'm grateful that all of you are, I hope actually one day I get to do what you're doing. It'll be fun to <laughs> teach seminary class. I've never done it. <laughs> but um, so uh, our students are being blessed in so many different ways. Uh, we, we're, we're even in the discussion topics with the online seminary division of, do we create special needs classes, you know, for kids who have more severe disabilities? And there's some discussion about that. So there's going to be, there's a lot of different opportunities, everything we're doing with ASL, something exciting. This first time ever, the church has assigned a general authority to chair the ASL board of education. So we have Elder Peter Johnson, who's now chairing that board. And it is amazing. I mean, I was literally in tears today in this meeting with Elder Johnson and hearing the wonderful things we're now able to do and having him say, I don't think that the rest of the general authorities know what you guys just shared with me, the needs of our members who are deaf. And he's like, I'm going to tell them now, you know, <laughs> it's just exciting. It's so exciting. There's so many great things happening. And, um, and I'm grateful to be here with you and, and appreciative of what you're doing and teaching. And I, I know this gospel is true and I love my savior and I share this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks brother Johnson. I really appreciate you, you meeting with us tonight. Um, I, I just add my testimony that it's so crucial for us to be able to discover every way possible to meet every single one of our students. If we're truly going to gather an entire generation of youth and young adults, we need to understand that that entire generation of youth and young adults are going to have different needs. And it's up to us to discover how best to meet those. And as we work with the Savior and with good people like Brother Johnson and others, we're going to be able to do so. And I leave with you with that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.